Buenos dias. Good morning. It's so good to see you all. Welcome, bienvenidos, to all of you who are here with us this morning, to the Goshen College students that are moving in, and also those of you who are watching us or listening through some form of technology. Let's begin this morning's service with prayer. God, creator of everything, thank you for allowing us to once again gather together as one, to sing, pray, and listen to what you want us to hear. Open our ears, our minds, and our hearts to grow in you and for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, I invite you to join me in the call to worship. The call to worship, as you've heard is, or seen, is in both English and Spanish. I will read it in both languages. You read it in the language that you feel most comfortable with. I would dare you to read it in the language you're not comfortable with. It doesn't matter if it sounds a little weird. It's just a dare. Open our eyes, our ears. Abre nuestros oídos. To hear your word, para escuchar tu palabra. Open our eyes. Abre nuestros ojos. To see your presence, para ver tu presencia. Open our arms, abre nuestros brazos. To embrace of community, to the embrace of community, al abrazo de la comunidad. Open our minds, abre nuestras mentes. To the beauty of truth, a la belleza de la verdad. Open our hearts, abre nuestros corazones, to the joy of new life, a la alegría de una nueva vida. Opening hymn, let's uh, stand and turn to number 30 in Voices Together, Jesus Calls Us.
This is the moment where we pray. We pray together. This morning, I will say the prayers of the people. But I invite you to join me in prayer, in your mind, in silence, and to also pray for those things that maybe you haven't let anyone know about. Um, I have a long list of prayer. I will not pray all of that this morning. But I invite you to join me in the prayers of the people. Don't forget to look at the email that goes out to the congregation. It shares prayer requests from those, of, those who call the office or share a prayer request with someone or one of the pastors. If you need prayer and you want us to know, please call us. Um, usually the Latinos send WhatsApp messages to me um, asking for prayer. Um, thank you for those of you who have called in. Also, I remind you to look at the Take Them a Meal email and encourage you to sign up. I have heard from some who have received these meals, especially some of the Latino families that some of you have taken meals to. They are so thankful. Thank you. Let us pray. Lord, there is so much to bring to you. At times, it feels as if the list is never ending. We are grateful for the opportunity to bring the heaviness of our hearts and the joys that we have before you. Thank you for listening to your children. We continue to pray for those who are ill and are, are recovering from illness, injury, or in rehab. James Hirsch, he's been at Gable's Greencroft Rehab since the end of July. He will remain there indefinitely. Please be with him and help him. John Schwarzendruber, as he recovers at home, Benjamin Rutt, as he works from home and has physical therapy twice a week. Give guidance to him, his family, and the medical personnel that are in charge of his care while he continues to receive treatment for a brain tumor. For Leonard Gross, as he continues to recover from pneumonia. For Dottie Kaufman, as she recovers from a fall. For Albert Maldonado, my nephew, as he continues to receive chemotherapy for testicular cancer. For Juana Rojas' friend, Raimunda Reyes, who is ill in Venezuela with very little to no medical resources. We pray and remember those who have had to say goodbye to a loved one. Help them as they mourn and grieve. Let them feel your embrace. Let them receive your peace. We pray for Tanya Schrock, her children, and her family as they deal with the traumatic death of a family member. And for Naomi Lederach's family as they also mourn her passing. We also pray for health officials such as Dr. Bethany Waite, Elkhart County Health Officer, continue to give wisdom and courage as health officials in the community encourage people to wear their mask for the well-being of all. We pray as the school year begins for you to give courage to teachers, staff, and administrators who are making decisions trying to keep people safe and healthy, for students and their families dealing with quarantine and illness, we pray for their safety also, not only from illness, but from other threats. We pray for Goshen College, for the new students as they move in and begin a new school year, for the administrators, the faculty, and staff. We pray for our state and those states whose COVID-19 cases are rising. Lord, bring healing. Bring healing, Lord, and eradicate this virus. Bring relief to countries who are also suffering with COVID-19 spikes and don't have the health systems we are blessed with 
in this and other countries who are prosperous. We pray for Pamela, our pastoral care pastor, as she begins her sabbatical, a way for her to care for herself. May she be able to do the things she wanted to do for rest and renewal. We pray for marriages who are on the brink of dissolution. Fill each party with courage and commitment to work at making things work. We also pray for those suffering from violence, provide a way out. We pray for single parents and the challenges they face every day. Give them courage and grace. For those who are facing homelessness and hunger, please provide for them. We also pray for Indonesia, Haiti, and other countries whose people are suffering not only from COVID, but also natural disasters. We pray for Afghanistan as they once again are under the rule of the Taliban. May justice and peace rain down on their country. We pray for the church and its people. May we shine brightly so the world is not confused of who you are and your love for the world. Lord, hear our prayers. In Jesus' name, amen. I now invite the families to come forward and get ready for children's time. Join, join us in the circle. We will be singing together to welcome them down is number 298. We will sing the first three verses as they are arriving and then uh, keep the book open because we will sing verses four and five at the end. Because this is a new hymn, I invite you to just sing the melody, uh, the first three verses, and then uh, by the time we get to four and five, you might be ready to try some harmony if you want to. Good morning. It's so good to see all of your faces today. I have a story, and it's from the book of Luke. And this is a story that Jesus told to his disciples. So listen carefully. Okay. Jesus told his disciples, there was a rich man whose manager was accused of wasting his possessions. So he called him in and asked him, what is this I hear about you? 
Give an account of your management because you cannot be manager any longer. The manager said to himself, What shall I do now? My master is taking away my job. I'm not strong enough to dig, and I'm ashamed to beg. I know what I'll do so that when I lose my job here, people will welcome me into their houses. So he called in each of his master's debtors. He asked the first, How much do you owe my master? 900 gallons of olive oil, he replied. The manager told him, Take your bill, sit down quickly, and make it 450. Then he asked the second, And how much do you owe? A thousand bushels of wheat, he replied. He told him, Take your bill and make it 800. The master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. For the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than are the people of the light. Sometimes I read stories like this in the Bible and it makes me scratch my head. I think, Jesus, why did you tell this story? What were you trying to say? So I've been thinking about this story a lot this week, but I want to know what you're thinking about this story as you just heard it. And Miss Tina has a mic that you can talk into if you have any thoughts about this story. And I know it can be scary to come up and talk in front of everyone. So Violet has some little fidgets that you can have if you come up and talk that you'll be able to play with for the rest of the service. So I'm going to ask you some questions. And if you come up and say something, then next you can come here and get a little toy to play with. Okay. All right. What happened in this story? What was this story about? Miles? The manager wanted to get payback on his master? The manager was getting payback for his master. Was it what was owed to his master? Do you remember it said, you owe a thousand? Take that and quickly write down 850. Do you understand what he was doing? He was letting the people owe less because he wanted them to do him favors, remember? He said, then they'll welcome me into their homes. Did this story remind you of any other stories that you've read before? Have you ever read a story like this before? Miles, you can come on up. (laughs) Do you want to come get something? Doesn't remind you of any other stories? Any adults that want (laughs) to? Okay, what questions do you have about this story? Does this story make you wonder anything, Harold? Jasmine? I tell my sister that that she doesn't have to give me as much candy that she owes me, but I get some of her room. Okay, so you've dealt shrewdly with people in your life before. I see. All right, so does anybody have any questions about this story? Anything that they wonder about? Did they call that person their master because they're slaves? He worked for him. That's a good question. It doesn't say that he was a slave. It says he was a manager, which I think would be different than a slave. Why would they call him master? That's what they used to call their bosses. Today, you would call that person your boss. 
So they're like servants. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is there anything we can learn from this story? All right, Miles, you can share one more time. That's it. That's it. There's always a way to get back on someone. There's always a way to get back. Mm -hmm. Especially when you're dealing as a person of the world. But I want to tell you what Jesus said about this after um, he told the parable. This is what he said. And um, we are different than the people of this world because we are people of the light and we're called to live our lives differently. So this is part of that different way of living that Jesus talks about after he tells this story. Does anyone want to hear what Jesus had to say about it after he told it? Okay. I tell you, Use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves so that when it is gone, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. And whoever with, is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. So if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? And if you have not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. All right. Did any kids want to make a comment and come up and get a fidget toy before we're done? Do you have any thoughts about this? Miles, sorry, you already shared your one last time. Anybody else? Violet, do you want to say any thoughts on this? Um, Go over. What do you think we can take away from this story? What's one thing that, you, that makes you think about? Say it into the mic. No one can serve two masters. No one can serve two masters. Yeah. That's, I really noticed that that is a big thing. I think that's the whole meaning of this story. Is um, that you? You can't serve two masters. You can't serve two masters, okay. All right, well, I have plenty of these left over. So <laughs> you all can come up and get one to keep your hands busy during the rest of the service. to say this because we worshiped here kind of, um, or we led worship here, 
in, in an empty space for a little bit over a year. And hearing the children and listening to their little feet run on the messiny and cry is a good feeling. <laughs> Um, I have to say it was very awkward um, in this building with no one here and no little voices. So thank you for bringing the children. It's a blessing. It is now time for us to listen to God speak to us through his word and his servant, Phil. Let us bless him this morning. God, we give thanks for Phil's life for his dedication to you and to your work. Open our ears to listen, our minds to receive and accept your counsel through Phil's words, and give our hearts the courage to do what you ask of us. In Jesus' name, amen. Blessings, Pastor. Que la gracia y la paz de Dios sean con ustedes. Grace to you and peace from our Lord Jesus Christ. I just want to echo what um, Madeline just said. I was thinking the exact same thing. It was just so wonderful to hear, hear the sounds of the children. Our scripture this morning is uh, found in Luke, the 16th chapter. Uh, beginning in the first, with the first verse and going through verse 9. Then Jesus said to the disciples, There was a rich man who had a manager, and charges were brought to him that this man was squandering his property. So he summoned him, and he said to him, What is this that I hear about you? Give me an accounting of your management, because you cannot be my manager any longer. Then the manager said to himself, What will I do, now that my master is taking the position away from me? I am not strong enough to dig, and I am ashamed to beg. I have decided what to do, so that when I am dismissed as manager, people may welcome me into their homes. So summoning his master's debtors, one by one, he asked the first, How much do you owe my master? He answered, A hundred jugs of olive oil. He said to him, Take your bill, sit down quickly, and make it fifty. Then he asked another, And how much do you owe? He replied, A hundred containers of wheat. He said to him, Take your bill and make it eighty. And his master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. For the children of this age are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than are the children of light. And I tell you, make friends for yourself by means of dishonest wealth, so that when it is gone, they may welcome you into the eternal homes. The word of the Lord. At, at Minnehoff, uh, the, uh, the um, uh, Mennonite Amish Anabaptist Interpretive Center in Shipshawana. I don't know how many have, been to, have you have been to Minnehoff? Well, that's a good number. That's great. So you'll know what I'm talking about. In, in the video, and I don't know, it's been a while since I've been to Minnehoff, and I, I, still don't, I don't know if they ha still have this video, but there's a video of a barn raising. Um, more, the, uh, even more than the tornado room. Uh, the barn raising image and video really captured, uh, captured my imagination on my visits. Part of it's because I have no construction ability at all, and so I see these people doing these amazing things up on these trusses and building barns and so on. But the, the, uh, the, the, the barn raising video at, at Minnehoff is, is a part of their presentation because it's such a central piece of um, Mennonite Anabaptist concepts of community. What, ha what the, the story invariably goes that, that somebody needs a barn, and maybe they need a barn because they, they haven't had one before and they need one, or maybe somebody needs a barn because their barn burned down, or maybe it rotted, or maybe it was destroyed by wind. Uh, who knows? But they need a barn. And so the community 
gathers around uh, that, that household that needs, needs, needs a barn because it's a major expense to build a barn. If you were to pay somebody to build, to build a barn, it would be an extraordinary amount of, of, of money that it would be, would be too much for a single household uh, to bear. But by coming together and sharing the expense and, and, and gifting labor, uh, a, barn, a, a barn can be raised. And so when we speak about community, this, this, this story, the, the, and the, the image of the barn raising becomes kind of, kind of central to how we, how we think about our faith as, as Mennonites and Anabaptists. And, and people come along, scholars and, and, and whatnot, economists and, and um, so on, come along and they, they, we, they try to label that, what that is. They call it mutual aid or a gift economy or economy of reciprocity. And, and those things are, are, in a sense, true, but at its, its core, it's nothing more than people being in relationship with each other, being in community. And, of, and, and part of that is, of course, there's, there's a measure of self-interest. And, and if, if my barn burns down, then, then the community's going to come and help me. So it's in my interest, presumably, to, to, to help somebody else. But my barn might not burn down. Uh, and maybe it's something else I'm, I'm going to need. Maybe there's some other kind of support and encouragement. Maybe there's some resources that the community can share with me that I'm going to, to need at some point. Or... Maybe it's going to be my children, or maybe it's going to be my grandchildren. Sometimes these relationships are, are multi-generational. And at, at the core of community is relationship, this regard for other people, this caring for other people who know each other, who are, who are part of a group of people that are, that are bound uh, together. In, in the church and that are committed to each other. At College Mennonite Church, we, we, we don't do barn raisings. I don't know if there's been a barn raising in the history of College Mennonite Church. Um, but there, there, there could be, I suppose, but we're mostly, there are a few farmers, but mostly we're not farmers, and mostly we don't have barns. But it, it, we do practice the, the spirit of barn raising at College Mennonite Church, and, some, and, and, and it doesn't take very long to figure it out if you're a, a visitor here or if you I mean, just read some of our materials. One of the things that we, that we have that's in the spirit of barn raising is something we call the Encircling Fund. Who, how many of you know have heard of the Encircling Fund? Um, maybe not quite as many of you who've, sort of, who've been to Mennonite and seen the barn raising video. Um, I've got to work on that. Um, the Encircling Fund is a fund that we have that uh, is there to help people when they have a need at a particular, at a particular time. And, and so they've fallen on hard times, maybe somebody's lost a job, or maybe uh, an illness has befallen them, any number of things can go wrong in the course of living a life, as those of us who are older realize. And the Encircling Fund is there to provide resources, financial resources. Of course, there are other ways. Uh, and and, and you've heard, you heard this morning, um, Pastor Madeline was talking about uh, meals for people and how meaningful and important that is. That's uh, the spirit of, of barn raising, rallying around and supporting people in a time of need. And it's all in the context of a relationship. Today I make a meal, and tomorrow I may receive a meal or, or a visit or some other thing that is valuable to me and important to me and critical for me in sustaining my life. The, there are a couple of stories I'm going to tell that are, that are, I think, more, maybe more recent in the life of our community. One, that, one has been shared already that, uh, uh, by Juana Rojas, uh, who's a part of, our, part of our church, a part of our community. And she has, living with her, she has two families. 
housing's tight in Goshen. I don't know if you were aware of that. If you're looking for a house right now, either to buy or to rent, it can be very hard, and it's expensive. And so if you're an immigrant coming to this community, it's, uh, it's, it, it can be really difficult to find a place to live. And so Juana has opened up her home to two young families from her home country of Venezuela. They're not necessarily people that, but, that she knows, but now they are a part of her circle and our circle of relationships. They have become a part of our community in the spirit of barn raising, in the spirit of sharing. And those families, by being a part of this community, also commit to share, by being here, to share of themselves and to share of their gifts for, uh, for times when we, when we have need, when any of us might have need. There's a, a, another story that's more specifically in the spirit of barn raising, and I te- tell these stories with some caution because they're about, about real people and real lives and making them uh, public. I, 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 want to, I, I don't want to share names. Um, but there's a, there's a family in, in our church that needed, they needed a house. They needed a house to live in. Uh, and for a variety of reasons, and it's a, it's a long story, they... they, they uh, They needed a house. And so there were some households from our church. You ready for this? Who bought them a house. Now, the arrangement's a little more complicated than that, but but, uh, at its core, they bought a house for this family. Now, I mean, there's questions of ownership and how that all, all works are still getting worked out. But it is a, was a, a gesture of generosity in the context of community, somebody they knew and had a relationship with. They bought a house, and then the house needed a lot of work. And a whole lot of you, some of you in this room, some of you who are uh, listening on the radio or watching um, on the internet, went over to that house and put your skills, of your building skills, to, to good use. Making that house a safer, more comfortable, better place to live for this family. And this family is a part of us. They are part of our community. And they share their gifts with us. And over the course of generations, like an Amish church or an Amish community, they will help us in time of need. It's community. I'm going to pivot. Warning. Don't get whiplash. This parable is a hard parable. (laughs) I'm so, I just was sitting, listening to you, Lisa, just in awe of engaging um, um, just the courage to engage this parable with the children, because it's a really hard parable. And I, when we were planning this, planning this uh, series on, on parables, I, you know, there are a whole lot of parables to choose from. And, and I kind of had an idea of, of sort of the themes or some kind of coherence, and I wanted one parable that would really, really be hard. <laughs> that I would preach on, that would really be challenging. So there are some hard ones that I said, ah, oh, let somebody else preach on that one. But this one I said, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take this one on because I, I've always found it really hard, maybe the hardest and strangest of all of Jesus' parables, where he's actually praising dishonesty and calling us to be dishonest. That's really strange and uncomfortable and disruptive. So I decided I'd give this a try. So I've been living with this a while, and I, had, I, got, a, I got lucky because Joe Manicum, the president of Heston College, pr- um, needed a place to preach uh, in July, and so I got this, this sermon got bumped to today. So I have more time to think about it and work on it. And I have to tell you that I have come to love this parable uh, the best of all, and, and, and partly because it's just so disruptive. It's just it just does not let us off the hook. 
Um, it doesn't let us come up with some sort of simple, simple kind of moral, and the moral of the story is. It, 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 it's challenging. So we have this, this man, and, and Miles, this, Miles, your questions were so wonderful. Where, where are you, Miles? Are you, I don't, know if, I, I don't see you, I don't have my glasses on. Um, Miles, your questions were just so wonderful. Thank you for those and your willingness to ask those questions. So this man was, was a manager. He was not a slave, he was an employee, by all we know, that he was a manager. And he was entrusted with a lot of, a lot of responsibility. The amounts of, the amounts of money in this commodity trading operation that this master had, that's a lot of money. Uh, uh, substantial resources involved there. And, and the, the, this, this, this employee, this manager, was either um, a scoundrel, uh, was, was embezzling, probably, but it's also possible that he was just merely incompetent, that he was squandering property because he didn't know how to manage it very well. But he ended up in this crisis point. The master calls him and says, what is this? Um, you're, th this is really costly to me and you can no longer be my manager. And this, this moment, you can imagine what this felt like to the manager. It's a moment of <gasps> panic, right? Up in the night, all night long, stewing and wondering. You know, we just get a few verses of this process, but you can imagine this was days of just of panic attacks and anxiety and what am I, what am I gonna do? What, what are my options here? I, I can't do this and I, and I can't do that and, and oh, what do I do? And he decides, you ready for this? I'm going to build a community. I'm going to build a community. And so what he does, as we see in the text, is he, he in this commodity trading business, he says the, he, he goes to these people who owe his master, uh, who owe his master commodities, goods, that presumably have been paid for, and he just <laughs> take the bill and quickly, he says quickly, cut it down. Well, why does he do that? He does that because he wants something in return. But he does it more than once. We don't know, maybe the two instances are given, but he, maybe he, he probably did this multiple times, to build a kind of community of people who had a positive regard for him, um, people with whom he was building a relationship, a bond, people who he could go to in time of need and who would help him and encourage him. And, and the thing that's important to say about this, and it's the same thing that's true in the barn raising, and it's the same thing that's true in the life of our community, is, is he's, giving, he's giving something that's very specifically measured, right? 100, 100 units of olive oil and take it down to 50. That's a very specific measurement. It's cutting it in half. But what he will get in return can't be measured. There's no way to measure that. And in the same way that there's a, there's, a, there's a barn raising, in the context of community, in the context of the community, in the barn raising, nobody's going down and writing, okay, we spent this much and 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 this much, and so, so the rest of us who helped with this project should get that much in return. Nobody's thinking that way because it's not that kind of economy. It's not that kind of relationship. It's not transactional. It's based on need, and it's based on community, and it's based on a positive regard. At the center of our community, it's important to say, no matter what Jesus says here <laughs> uh, about, dis about being dishonest, don't be dishonest. Don't try this at home. Uh, don't try this in your workplaces. At the center of our community is not dishonesty, but truth. Namely, God, who is 
truth. God who is truth is at the center of our community. The psalmist says that God does not deal with us according to our sins or repay us according to our iniquities. Would you think about that? God does not deal with us according to our sins or repay us according to our iniquities. Would you think about how that connects with the parable? God is not keeping account. God does not have a little book like a manager, or God does not have a bunch of managers who are keeping account. Check, check, no, 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 50 on that, no, that's 25, no, no. God's not doing that. God is not working in that kind of economy. The psalmist says God remembers that we are dust. God remembers that God formed us out of the dust and breathed life into us. God remembered. God remembers that we are sacred, imbued by God, breathed into by God with the gift of life. God remembers in God's relationship with us who we are, and God loves us. Jesus asks us to look at ourselves and each other the way that God looks at us. And in the context of Christian community, this truth is at the center. Ultimately, at the end of the day, it's not self-interest that motivates us. Well, it is, maybe. But there's a higher calling for us. And that calling is to treat each other with the same dignity that God treats us. Amen. I invite you to turn to number 831, our hymn of response, Blessed Be the Tie That Binds, verses 1, 2, and 4. It's time where we as a community give to God from our finances. 
those gifts that he provides to us. Um, we are collecting coins. Oh, they put towels in there. Does anybody know why they put towels in there? I was ready for the sound. <laughs> Yes, I was looking forward to the sound. Um, we are collecting coins, and we just arrived back from Puerto Rico yesterday, and I kept telling myself, don't forget the coins, don't forget the coins, and I ran out of the house this morning, and guess what? I forgot the coins. We are collecting coins for MCC's water projects around the world. That's another way that we demonstrate that we are a community, by helping those around us who need water, people who we've never seen, clean water. So come forward, drop your coins, make it loud, I'm sorry, musicians, and That's bring good. your offerings forward. We will be singing the insert, Take My Life and Let It Be. As we have done in previous Sundays, we're singing verses one, three, and five. This Sunday, uh, and those verses are in English, this Sunday I invite you to sing the refrain in Spanish and we'll start with the refrain. We're getting better at that song, I think, getting more comfortable with the rhythms and all, and I, was, I, I sort of got distracted, and I didn't realize I needed to get up here. Please join me in prayer. Gracious God, we thank you for giving us life. We thank you that you remember that you have given us life, and that you are with us and committed to us, to be with us, for us, all our days, and we give you thanks and praise. We ask that these gifts that we return to you be used for your service, for building your community. We pray all these things in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. I invite you to turn, and we're gonna sing Rain Down, and I invite you to stand.
I have a few favorite songs over the past three years that I've picked up here, and the last two are the songs that make me want to just run around and sing them. Have you ever had a song that you just want to sing as loud as you can? It doesn't matter how you sound. That's me with those two. <laughs> um, after the benediction, please stay seated for what's growing. Listen to the benediction out of Colossians. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Go in peace. <laughs>